So, first of all, hello, and we are very excited to meet you online. And we will be even more excited when you come to Vilnius and visit our library. My pleasure. I look forward to that. Very, very good. Very good. <clears throat> please, uh, please don't forget us. And I hope we will continue our talks. So now the topic of the lecture is announced that it's about man and God and law. And it's uh, united by Bob Dylan. But would you agree to start with a couple of words uh, from the situation you are in, in Israel? What is the, what is the condition? What is the state of mind of people? Is it uh, later on, we we'll maybe will turn back. Uh, does this philosophy help to interpret the current situation? Uh, so, what's going on now today? I am Beijer. Uh, how how do you feel your nation fighting against terrorism? Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak with you. I hope that my Lithuanian is good enough for this uh, audience. You'll tell me if I've mi mispronounced any words. Of course. Of course, I will only be speaking in English, so it will be easy for you. <laughs> um, I also am pleased to be speaking with you about a Lanzmann. Bob Dylan, of course, does not come directly from your neighborhood, but close enough yeah. today. And, um, you know, we, we, only ha we only have an hour, <clears throat> so that's not enough time even for me to answer your question about how life feels in Israel. It feels, um, it feels bad. It is a very, very difficult time. I think that anyone who exists exists in the world is familiar with how painful, absurd, and uh, difficult it is to be living in a time of war. The news each day brings um a lot of sorrow uh, all of our families are are affected those of with who have children who are fighting or children who are captive or friends and family who are fighting or who are captive our prayers um have not been answered on the level of seeing how this conflict will end. I think the general feeling in Israel is one of commitment to seeing to the destruction of Hamas to whatever level is possible. It's not clear what is possible right now. We stand united behind our soldiers, behind the families of the hostages and the hostages. We recognize that Israel is, as each person here understands in a different way, perhaps, how imperfect we are uh, as a country but also how justified we are in fighting the evil of Hamas, in fighting the evil of anti-Semitism, and in fighting for what we believe is uh, the destiny of, of Israel. I'm speaking to you from Jerusalem and it is our belief, which will never change, that Israel 
is the eternal home of the Jewish people and that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of the Jewish people. We are speaking today um, across borders and across time in a sense because the challenges of making a meaningful life, a life of, of service and purpose uh, is, is unchanging for thousands of years. And um, when we talk about Bob Dylan, who is, I believe, one of the most important artists of his time, we recognize that while Dylan has not spoken directly to the themes of Judaism for most of his career, he has been an artist who has been focused on the life of the spirit, on living a life of purpose, on living a life which is grounded in the understanding that what we as people, man, humankind, people, is a journey through the law, religion, morality, um, the places and spaces where we live to do, live, sing, write, read, teach, learn in some way in the presence of the divine. You could be an atheist and experience what you might not call the divine you might call it meaning, you might call it love. If you're a religious person, you may experience that as being called God. But the work and the journey of Bob Dylan is a journey to try to make sense of the, the triangle, if you will. I won't say Trinity, although there have been times when Dylan has talked about that very explicitly because he's been involved in Christianity, he's been interested in Christianity, he lived a portion of his life um, immersed in Christianity. We don't deny that. Um, but from the time he emerged as an artist in the early 1960s until today, he has been wrestling with the questions of how man, humankind, God, uh, purpose, meaning, are expressed through the doing of life, which is law. What does it mean? Um, who are the people in this neighborhood of trying to make sense of, of man and God and law? Uh, this is the work of prophets. This is the work of prophets, but as I'll share with you, while Bob Dylan would never say that he was a prophet, he does play a prophetic role. Who are the prophets? Who are the individuals who take on the responsibility and the challenge of living a prophetic life and for artists, for musicians, for writers, for creators, for people of faith of different kinds, it is how they express their struggle to make sense of man and God and law that they make their greatest work. This is, this is my uh, opinion, having um, spent my adult life in the work of of education, spirituality, music. And uh, I see Dylan is one of the great figures uh, of the struggle. 
And I think you would agree. Even if you will not be joining us today in person, my apologies. I know that we all hope that Bob Dylan himself would attend this Zoom session. He's busy. Unfortunately, he will not be joining us, but his vision will join us. And to that end, I want to begin with a song that was written just a few years ago called False Prophet. So Dylan addresses the theme of prophecy time and time again in his work. And here, um, your homework, your exam, uh, the grade that you will receive from the, from the library staff uh, will be based on whether you want to go to uh, Spotify or wherever you find your music to listen to some of these th songs that I'll reference. And think if you hear a prophetic voice as I do. When Bob Dylan uh, released the album Rough and Rowdy Ways in 2021, it was the height of the COVID epidemic. The um, world was reeling with questions about life and death and um, how to make sense of it. Dylan uh, released Rough and Rowdy Ways, which is an album which plays with the same themes that he's always played with, but uh, with a, a kind of sense of timing that is profound. And, and Dylan says, um, as you can see, and I'll, I'll read some of these lyrics to you to emphasize my point, uh, to present the question of what is a prophet? What is a false prophet? That's a term from the Bible, a term throughout religious traditions, that one of the challenges of people of faith is determining who's a real prophet and who's a false prophet. Um, another day that don't end, another ship going out, another day of anger, bitterness and doubt. I know how it happened. I saw it begin. I opened my heart to the world and the world came in. And if I can paraphrase our friend, Bob, he's saying here that to experience the world is to experience anger and doubt. To open one's heart to the world is to understand how deep and many times unanswerable are the questions of what it means to live a good life. And in the third verse, he says, I'm the enemy of treason, enemy of strife. I'm the enemy of the unlived, meaningless life. I ain't no false prophet. I just know what I know. I go where only the lonely can go. So whatever your preferred language might be, to say I ain't no false prophet if you do the math if you do the mathematics of the formula presented i ain't no false prophet equals what i am a prophet i'm not a false prophet i'm a prophet what makes me a prophet first of all i opened my heart to the world in the first verse secondly what makes me a prophet in paraphrasing Dylan, I'm the enemy of treason. I'm the enemy of going against what I have loyalty to. That is what is treason, is going against your loyalties. I'm the enemy of strife. If I'm the enemy of strife, I'm a man of peace. Strife is war. I'm the enemy of the unlived, meaningless life. I do not accept nihilism. I do not accept that we are here for no reason. I do not accept absurdity. And as we'll hear later from another friend who you know well, Franz Kafka, Kafka too wrestles with those questions. Can you live with the existential dilemma of whether or not your life is meaningless? And Dylan says no. And Dylan says he, as a prophet, who is not alone in being a prophet, I'm going to suggest he thinks that everyone can be a prophet. It is only through seeking meaning. It is only by being a person of peace 
And it is only by honoring one's loyalties that you can live a good life. Now, in the final verse, he brings in what he will bring in time and time again is that the questions of meaning and the questions of prophecy and the questions of living a good life often come down to love, life, and death. You know, darling, he says, addressing his lover, whoever she is, wherever she is, maybe it's Mary Lou, maybe it's Miss Pearl from the second verse. You know, darling, the kind of life that I live. And this is the good life, as I've suggested. When your smile meets my smile, a something's got to give. In other words, you open your heart, as he does in the first verse. You engage with the world. You seek peace. You seek love. You communicate. You give that smile to someone, and they smile back. This is a truth. False prophet does not have to prove if God exists. False prophet does not have to bring redemption. I'm sorry, a prophet does not have to prove that God exists. A prophet does not have to prove redemption. A prophet needs to seek love and truth. I can't remember when I was born. I forgot when I died. In other words, what is the key to eternal life? A smile, seeking peace, seeking love. Those are big statements for a rock star. Those are big statements for a man who's spent the past 60 years traveling the globe singing music. And yet, I think these are messages that we could find all the way back in the Bible all the way through the religious traditions that we know, whether it's Judaism, Christianity, Islam, the monotheistic religions, if we were to go to the East, we'd find these truths as well. So here you have the thesis that Bob Dylan is a kind of prophet, and also that he is inviting every person who has the ability to seek peace, to be the enemy of war, and to be loyal to the things that they care about. Any person who seeks love and is willing to meet a smile with a smile, that's a prophet too. Would Marlon Brando agree? Ah, this is a question. You may or may not be familiar with this image from The Wild One. That's a film from 1953 starring Marlon Brando. And in a scene that Dylan knows well, because he mentions it in a recent book that he wrote called The Philosophy of Modern Song, and I hope that he um, discovered this connection through his glancing through my book, which mentions this uh, scene uh, in detail. Marlon Brando plays a biker who walks into a roadside bar, a pub, and is asked by a woman who comes up to him, Marlon Brando playing a character called Johnny, she says, Johnny, what are you rebelling against? What is your rebellion? And Marlon Brando, as Johnny says, what have you got? He says, I rebel against everything. So that's the flip side of being a prophet. To rebel against everything, to have just anger and not love. Now, Brando cracks open culture at a time where figures like Elvis and Brando and James Dean and even Frank Sinatra in certain ways are challenging the typical status of an entertainer, of an actor or a musician, but also showing how the arts in particular can force mainstream culture and society to assess who they are and what they're about. In The Wild One, when Dylan sees Marlon Brando saying that he is a rebel, when Dylan, as a teenager, hears James Dean in the film 
rebel without a cause, also say he just is rebelling against everything, the world is cracked open. But Dylan's job is to try to make sense of what this rebellion is about. Now, a long time before Brando and a long time before Dylan, a sociologist philosopher named Max Weber taught that the religions of the world, by and large, generally speaking, had lost their ability to actually be prophetic because the religions of the world were not serving the themes that we saw in the first song. They were not seeking peace. They were not being loyal to the cause of love. They were not able to return a smile with a smile. Weber said that the religions had died and that at some point in the future, right around the time when Brando and James Dean and Elvis and Bob Dylan emerged, it could be that artists were the prophets who were able to convey the religious sensibility that religions were supposed to convey. That's Max Weber. And he, in a sense, prophesied or predicted the world that Dylan would come to drive forward, which is the world in particular of popular music, making sense of the world where religion could not, and popular music taking on the responsibility for prophecy. When Dylan sings in the uh, song Sugar Baby, I got my back to the sun because the light is too intense. I can see what everybody in the world is up against. You could turn back, you can't come back. Sometimes we push too far. One day you'll open up your eyes and you'll see where we are. Once again, the theme from this song, Sugar Baby. But um, 13 or 14 years earlier than the song we first listened to or talked about, False Prophet. Once again, the reality that religion is meant to provide to people, seeking peace, seeking a kind of loyalty, seeking a kind of love, the personal connection, the connection with God in a pure life-affirming sense, if the priests and the prophets can't do it in a traditional sense, then the musicians will. And this is a testament of a kind that Dylan offers, a testament of saying, if you listen closely to the music, lit by the sun, lit by knowledge, lit by, lit by enlightenment, if you listen to the music, you will find truth in the same way that you would find truth by reading a sacred text. That's late stage Dylan. Let's go back to an earlier stage of Dylan. Let's go back to Desolation Row. When Dylan emerged in the early 60s, he was a unique force on the scene of culture. There were, of course, the Beatles who changed the way that music, fashion, youth, could power people's thoughts and dreams. The economy, the Beatles were revolutionary in being able to reach a global audience and simply change the way people saw the world. But it was actually Dylan who convinced the Beatles in a couple different ways that I want to hold your hand to meet a smile with a smile, if you will, was not enough. And by the time the mid 60s came, everybody wanted to be Bob Dylan and the Beatles combined. They wanted the fashion, the charm, the melody, the reach of the Beatles, but they wanted to say something that matters like Bob Dylan. And Bob Dylan himself admits 
that he is playing a role. Everyone's looking to Dylan in the 60s, and he says, if I wasn't Bob Dylan, I'd probably think that I had a lot of answers myself, because Dylan is taking that prophetic role. He's combining it with rock and roll, combining it with the rebellion of the Brandos and the Deans, and this is where Dylan takes popular music into the realm where prophets and poets and philosophers had once ruled. He says in 2000, uh, uh, he says, and actually this is from 2001, that's a typo. I, I mean, you're talking to a person that feels like he's walking around in the ruins of Pompeii all the time. He released his album, Love and Theft, coincidentally on 9-11, on the day where more than 3,000 people were killed when um, ISIS terrorists attacked America. And that's a story that's still unfolding. We can trace the story of Iran and Hamas and Hezbollah back to the tragic, horrific success of ISIS on 9-11. And when Dylan was asked, what does it mean to release an album on that day? He said, for me, it's always been about walking around in the ruins or the destruction, referencing Pompeii, the famous freezing of time when Mount Vesuvius erupted and froze an entire population in a moment in time, in a massive natural disaster. So Dylan sees himself as a person walking around in a world of ghosts, a world of fragments, a world of brokenness. And the song Desolation Row in 1965 is really one of the master works of the period. It's as important a song as T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland was for poetry. And it is, um, I think, as important as any novel or any song written uh, during its era, uh, during the 20th century. And he says, when I received your letter yesterday about the time the doorknob broke, you asked how I was doing. Was that some kind of joke? All these people that you mentioned, yes, I know them. They are quite lame. I had to rearrange their faces and give them all another name. Right now, I can't read too good. Don't send me no letters, no. Not unless you mail them from Desolation Row. This is the other side of prophecy. There's one side of prophecy that says, I will seek light. I will seek love. I will seek justice. I will seek connection. But there's another side of prophecy that says, I will describe to the world what's broken. I will witness for the world what's broken. And this is the story of Desolation Row, where on the one hand, in his later career, Dylan says, if you can meet a smile with a smile, that's a kind of prophecy. But in Desolation Row, he's saying, unless you can see the destruction and the pain of people around you, you're actually not a prophet. You can't join me in this story unless you can see the desolation. And so here he is testifying and witnessing that somewhere between love and destruction, love and war, love and theft is the title went of the album released on 9-11. That's where Dylan's music is found. And everything is found there. So if we go back to the album from 2021, Rough and Rowdy Ways, Dylan paraphrases or quotes a poem by the American poet Walt Whitman, who was a romantic poet, gay, proudly American, rebellious, a fighter for love and justice. And Dylan takes a phrase from Whitman's poem, which is, I contain multitudes, in which Whitman describes himself as a kind of container for all of America. Dylan agrees that that's the job of the poet, the job of the prophet. 
he is a vessel for containing everything. Everything from Anne Frank to Indiana Jones, everything from the Rolling Stones to William Blake, everything from blue jeans to a fast car, everything from Beethoven to Chopin, that the great artist, the great visionary, the great prophet can open one's heart as he did in the first song we mentioned. We talked about how he opened his heart and the world came in. Once your heart is open, you can know everything. You can experience everything. You can see everything. And you have the right and maybe the obligation to speak your truth about the desolation, about the love, about the enlightenment, about the fear containing multitudes. Now, how does this fit into the theme that um, I shared in, in my book about man and God and law? The human, divine, lived experience of the world. The phrase man and God and law actually comes from a song from 1966. You might know it. Um, the song is called Maggie's Farm. And uh, Dylan says here, in, as he often does, riffing off of or responding to a previous song, in this case, a song called Penny's Farm from 1927 during the Great Depression. Penny's Farm was a song about American farmers who were poor and were unable to uh, support themselves because of the industry of agriculture crushing the family farm. And Dylan pushes that song 40 years forward to 1965. The farm is now not just a farm, it's the whole world. In uh, world mythologies, certainly in the American mythologies, you'll often find the story of the wanderer who comes to a farm and winds up falling in love with the farmer's daughter. That's Maggie. But the farm is symbolic for the world as a whole. The parents are symbolic for the powers that control the world unjustly. Dylan's in love. He's working on the farm. He says, I ain't going to work for Maggie's ma no more, for her mother. I ain't going to work for Maggie's ma no more. She talks to all the servants, the powerless ones, about man and God and law. Everybody says she's the brains behind Pa. She's 68, but she's She's 68, but she says she's 24. I ain't going to work for Maggie's ma no more. What's it mean? It means that in a corrupt society, the leadership is lying about who it really is. It says it's 24. It says it's like you, Bob Dylan, who was 25, 26 at the time he wrote this song. She's not like you. You're a servant, and she's telling you to be quiet by claiming that she understands the secret of good life, of how to combine man and God in law. But Dylan says, no, I won't work for that boss anymore. I won't work for her understanding anymore. I need to be free. And to be free on the same album, on the same era, 1966, the song Absolutely Sweet Marie. Dylan says in this song, what could easily be a saying from one of the prophets in certain ways, to live outside the law, to live outside the law, to be an outlaw, like Jane Steen was an outlaw, like Marlon Brando was an outlaw, to be outside the law, you must be honest. 
You must be honest. What does it mean to be honest when you're outside of the law? Isn't the law meant to keep us honest? Isn't the law meant to connect us between man and God? And the answer that Dylan gives is his whole canon. How to be honest when you cannot trust the supposed prophets of the world. As a musician, he's giving an answer to these questions. So that's why I called the book about man and God and law, because essentially my effort was to try to show through themes from Dylan's music about America, about law, about love, about race, about death, about politics, all these different themes, that in fact, Dylan was all along wrestling with this question of man and God and law. So we started with prophets and false prophets. We talked about the dichotomy, the paradox between uh, love and destruction, brokenness and finding harmony. These are two touch points to uh, axes, to um, poles, where Dylan sees the tension and wants to go into that tension. Now, it's not in any way a tension that is only restricted to Dylan. Dylan is part of a family tree of artists who live in a world where religion is not able to provide the answers that they seek. It is through art, creativity, that they find truth, that they find answers. And Kafka, who is, I think, in some sense, an ancestor of Dylan, is asking the same questions. Uh, if you are familiar with Kafka, uh, perhaps you're familiar with the novella, The Trial. And if so, then you're familiar with the story of Before the Law. So um, rather than read it to you, I'm going to paraphrase the story. But when you do your homework and listen to the music like you're supposed to, um, you will uh, also be welcome to read this story. And if you're interested, you can find a recording online of Orson Welles the great filmmaker actually reading this story. It's really, really cool to hear uh, Orson Welles, who I think has the voice of God uh, reading this story. If you're familiar with the story, a man from the country comes to um, a, a gate. Um, the man from the country that Kafka describes is probably a play on the Hebrew term Am Haaretz, which means a simple person, um, sort of a nobody, who comes and wants to enter the gates of the law. He wants enlightenment. He wants to find truth. And he's unable to enter. And the guard who might be familiar to you from many government offices, or perhaps a priest or maybe a rabbi, or maybe an imam is standing before the law and playing with the intellectual weakness of the man from the country. Eventually the man from the country who waits his entire life to be admitted to the law asks 
one final time if he can enter. Everyone strives after the law, says the man. So how is it that at these many years, no one except me has requested entry? And the gatekeeper sees the man is already dying. And in order to reach his diminishing sense of hearing, he shouts at him, he shouts at the man. Here, no one else can gain entry since the entrance was assigned only to you. Now I'm going to close it. So when we think about Kafka's career and his frustrations and his brilliance and his unhappiness and his dying young. And you think about him feeling like an outsider, an outsider to Judaism, an outsider to the world, political outsider. You can imagine this being the story of an outlaw someone who's trying to live outside the law, but isn't honest. If the man from the country had been honest with himself, he would have been honest enough to know that that was his gate. He would have been honest with the gatekeeper to say, let me in. But he couldn't do it because he didn't have the bravery, he didn't have the prophecy maybe, to demand what was really his. And he dies outside the law. Dylan doesn't accept that. Dylan doesn't accept that throughout his canon. But if we look specifically to songs that really take on that theme of the law, there's a song from 1978 on the album Street Legal, in which Dylan sings a song called Senor. This is during a period where Dylan is wrestling with Christianity. Señor in Spanish means the Lord. It means Jesus. The point being that Dylan is coming before the gatekeeper. And Dylan says to the gatekeeper, much like the man from the country, do you know where we're heading? What's happening here? Do you know where she's hiding? Where is my truth? How long are we going to be riding? Where will this journey ever end? How long must I keep my eyes glued to the door? How long will I wait at this gate before you open it? Will there be any comfort for me? And the gatekeeper doesn't answer. Senor doesn't answer. But the man from the country here, Bob Dylan, does not accept the answer like the man from the country did. In the final verse, he says, let's disconnect these cables. Let's overturn these tables. Same way, by the way, that Jesus overturned the tables outside the temple in the New Testament. This place don't make no sense for me no more. Can you tell me what we're waiting for, Senor? Waiting like Samuel Beckett's Godot the waiting for Godot. How long can you wait for somebody else to open the door for you to enlightenment? How long can you wait for Maggie's mom to open the door for you? You can't wait. You have to kick in the door. You have to open the door. You have to take agency and enter the truth on your own. So the story of about man and God and law is a story of how Dylan comes to the gate and does not accept staying outside of the gate. He does not accept that a religion or a government or a policy or a politician can block him from entering in to a kind of truth. When Dylan entered the era of COVID at the time when he um, released the album that was called Rough and Rowdy Ways. The first um, song that he released from that album was called Murder Most Foul. You really need to listen to this song, Murder Most Foul. It's an 18 minute long song, which basically imagines John F. Kennedy dying, having been shot, 
and he imagines as Dylan the music and the truths of his life in a world that's ending. Now, Dylan came of age when Kennedy became president and when Kennedy was assassinated. And in a lot of ways, for a lot of Americans and other people around the world, it was Kennedy who represented hope. Kennedy, who was a gatekeeper who had opened the gates. Uh, Kennedy, who um, confronted uh, your old friend Khrushchev in Cuba and actually in a very complicated period of time was able, at least at that time, to prevent a nuclear war. Now, it's not clear if either side actually wanted that war or not. But the point is that Kennedy, who reluctantly accepted the call for civil rights for African Americans, who eventually accepted that the Cold War was a lie, who actually was prepared to take the United States out of Vietnam, all of these were core issues for Dylan, race, racism, war, Cold War. Dylan grew up at a time where American children practiced going under their desks when they were going to be bombed by a nuclear weapon. Dylan saw the death of Kennedy as being what broke the world. And so at the age of 81, 60 years later, he wrote a song called Murder Most Foul. It was during the height of COVID. And the song was released with a tweet. We used to call it Twitter. Now we call it X. And here's what he said in his Twitter. Releasing the song. Greetings to my fans and followers with gratitude for all your support and loyalty across the years. This is an unreleased song we recorded a while back that you might find interesting. Stay safe, stay observant, and may God be with you. Bob Dylan. Now, Bob Dylan's a joker and a comic and a hustler, and he likes show business, and he does whatever he wants. But he's also an honest man. Because to live outside the law, you must be honest. And his message to us is that we should be seeking God, whatever that means to us, as a religion, as a philosophy, as living the good life, whatever it is. Staying observant might be observant to a religion, but staying observant means having your eyes open. You need to find your own law. That being human is about being awake and being aware and seeking truth. To be able to do that for 60 years as an artist is a, is a legacy that any prophet could be proud of. And if we trace the story of Dylan as an artist and imagine it as a story of the truth trying to find its way into the world, of a truth coming to us to teach all of us, no matter how big and ugly and violent and imposing our leaders might be, that we have to stay observant and we can't back down. And when we come up against the gate, someone's not gonna open for us. We have to find a way to open it for ourselves. And this is the story of man and God in law. These are the themes that I've tried to explore in my book. And uh, I welcome your thoughts or questions now. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, first of all, it's interesting whether uh, somehow the interpretation of Bob Dylan as a prophet and what he's conveying does it relate some, somehow to Judaism or it's simply mm, a set of, of your human values and the way you see the world? 
Yeah, I, I think that I think that Dylan does not come as a traditional Old Testament prophet or as a, a rabbi or sage who's trying to interpret the law through a, a set of rules to live by halakha, Jewish law, or anything like that. Um, he's much more about um, a kind of human spirit, which is committed to um, to truth. So I don't think he plays the role of the Jewish prophet in this sense, but I think you can use it for that. I think that it's almost like if you want to bring the spirit of Dylan to Judaism, it's very, very easy to do so. And I wouldn't be surprised if he, in his own personal understanding of himself, felt that it's because he's Jewish or because he experienced what it's like to be Jewish, it, it, it wakes him up to these questions. It makes him aware of these questions. So I agree with you that um, the question of how much this is actually specifically Jewish is an open question, but the spirit of what he's doing is and should be applied to Judaism. But actually, I <clears throat> was meaning yourself when <clears throat> you clarify or, or you filter out uh, and formulate the the set of values and, and rules uh, Bob Dylan approaches the world and his creativity. Did you use kind of Judaic uh, set of criteria uh, to to purify this form of, of uh, <clears throat> approaching the world, really? Um, I, I, um, I, uh, my academic training is in Midrash, is in rabbinic interpretation of sacred text. So I approach Dylan's lyrics as sacred text. So I use Midrashic methods to approach, um, Dylan. Um, I saw the lyrics as being like sacred text. I used the mindset or the methodology of Midrash to try to pull out uh, from Dylan um, these 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 questions and these themes. So for me, this was definitely an act uh, of kind of Jewish textual interpretation of Midrash. And to that end, for me, um, I don't think that I would have had the methodology to to do this, if not for having the Jewish element in my uh, creative scholarly skill set. Okay. Uh, just a very short question about uh, concerning that um, part when he's at the gates uh, of paradise and not being let in. Uh, does it relate to the song of knock on heaven's door? Not oh, knock sure. on yeah. heaven's door. Yeah, you yeah. meant that. But you, <laughs> I was yeah. surprised you didn't mention it in, in your question. Uh, you know, you know Dylan, yeah. You know, Dylan has a um, a brand of whiskey and uh that he made. It's his brand of whiskey, and it's called Heaven's Door. Okay. So, <laughs> uh, yeah, I would definitely, I think there are a lot of songs about, um, about that moment, um, ain't talking, um, trying to get to heaven before they close the door. Um, and, 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 um, uh, knocking on heaven's door. Many, many songs, going, going, gone. There's a whole bunch of Dylan songs that deal with that theme of being at the gate. So yeah. is it characteristic of Judaism prophecy not to accept the situation when the gates of, uh, of, of paradise are not open to you? Well, I think that from a mystical point of view, the, the goal of 
of Jewish practice is to open the gates. It's to connect with the Sfirot. It's to connect with the Godhead. It's to connect with the divine. So, you know, for the for for in the realm of theurgy, in the realm realm of theology, the mitzvot, the commandments, are there to open the gates of heaven. You are there for the purpose of communing with the holy, um, and in that sense, um, you know, you're born at the gate. Your job is to open it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So. Uh, actually, would Judaism reject kind of uh, already scientific approach, which is too pessimistic, or like speaking about the fall of, of Europe, of uh, the yeah. humanism, yeah. and so on? I don't think um, Judaism uh, is a I don't think there's anything that we can say is is Judaism about everything. In other words, Judaism says just about everything about everything, right? Um, and I think that the great Jewish philosophers, you know, think about uh, Maimonides. If you think about, um, um, you know, even Spinoza. Like if you think about the the great philosophers. They would say Einstein, you know, they would say whatever you can come up with, whatever system you can use to unlock that gate, use it. Um, it doesn't have to be, you make it kosher later, right? <laughs> we'll worry if it's kosher, uh, if it works. Like you, 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 you know, at the extreme, you have Shabtai Tzvi and, and uh, Yaakov Frank, and, uh, you know, who are saying <clears throat> we're even willing to go outside of Judaism in order to unlock the gates. Um, and then it becomes a question, you know, what about Christianity? I mean, Jesus is basically saying, I, I, I don't have enough tools here in Judaism. I have to go outside the, 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 the toolbox somehow to open the gates of heaven. Maybe part of it is that when it becomes so extreme that you're willing to do anything, maybe that is a question of does it count Jewishly? But um, I don't think that the great teachers reject out of, they, there are very few things that the great teachers would truly object to um, if they can do the work of opening heaven. Um, I, you know, the Rabbi of Lubavitch, um, I, I would just imagine that, uh, you know, he was willing to try just about anything that also. Chabad is willing to try just about anything uh, to open the gates. So I think there's a grand tradition of that. And symbolically, don't you think that it's uh, very similar or maybe even the same to relate it with William Blake, the doors of perception? Yes, yes. That's a Dylan and Dylan is a big fan of Blake. And uh, I know Blake, you know, in his understanding of of, of of poetry and mythology also saw himself as writing sacred texts. So um, Dylan definitely has a lot of um, love of Blake and connection with that way of approaching uh, making art. Opening doors after doors. Yeah, the doors of the doors of uh, and the doors of perception and and the doors <laughs> again of another perception. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And <clears throat> uh, so, uh, can we say that open mindedness is the key of uh, philosophy of being a prophet in art? Say not just not specifically and not necessarily just in Ju in Juda Judaic sense, but just being a prophet, meaning being open, being optimistic. Well, I think that there's an element of discipline too. You know, um, being open-minded or open-hearted surely 
is part of it. But then you have to be able to be very disciplined in order to do something with it. You know, if you're just a hippie who's just open, 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 uh, then, you know, it's easy for you to just be sucked into whatever is happening around you as opposed to really being able to to be disciplined and to focus. So um, I see those as being, uh, now you wouldn't need just one skill, you need both, in my opinion. So that's why your book is, uh, the title of your book ends with law. So yeah. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. You right. need the rules to, to open the doors, actually. Right. And that's to approach right. the, the following the other doors. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. But in this sense, uh, we can uh, see a lot of artists and philosophers who would share maybe the similar attitude and even humanistic attitude to return smile for a smile, uh, as as you specified it. So I believe you you still have many many objects of investigation to to write about and <laughs> to research and to give interesting reports. Uh, do you have any plans about that? About plans about? About next. further, further um, writing. I'm, I'm uh, uh, working on a novel right now and, uh, and that's, um, that's my that's my my fun, uh, and we we do uh, run here in Jerusalem many many programs, whether it's study or music or uh, Zionism, where we try to help people uh, figure out their gate and how to open it. So that's 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 what we do. Um... <clears throat> Uh, I'll ask uh, our, our colleague uh, Sharon, maybe she's got some questions. No, she has one. So, uh, we, we will uh, refer to the to those who are connected and are listening. So, she'll ask whether there are questions coming from them, um, from those who, who listen to a lecture online. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but I would, I would think, would like to add something already stepping out of the borders of this defined uh, topic, maybe, but not very far away from it. Uh, we're speaking about kind of <coughs> brave optimism to open gates, open doors. And, and to insist on, on the gates being opened, right? Uh, <clears throat> and not to lose faith in, 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 in that, that it is possible um, with the help of well, law, uh, with the help of rules as well. But since you are working on many topics and on novel, would you add something like um, what, what role is played by, say, humor in that. Are you ready for this kind of question? <laughs> uh, oh, in what, ready for what kind of question? Uh, uh, how humor. Ah, uh, humor. You, yeah. Oh, right. Um, well, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm committed to humor. I mean, I don't trust people who don't have a good sense of humor. I think if you don't have a good sense of humor, you're you're not taking, you know, it's like humor is one of the great keys to opening the doors of, of knowledge. You know, it's humility, it's seeing things upside down, it's being able to poke fun at yourself and 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 not take anything too seriously because we know in the end that we're just people. So yeah, I would definitely say that humor is is a key element. And can you relate some some very painful moments uh, of history of human history and the Jewish history uh, in order when to when describing tragedies, the recent 
the recent outswords and say Holocaust or whatever, yeah. as a metric, is it possible to to have humor not far away from from the dark? Uh, you know, here in Israel, there has been um, you know a lot of sorrow. There there has been some some humor uh, that's been used to try to help us. Uh, understand things some dark humor some black humor um there's 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 certainly a place for it um and and we hear it we see it um but i think that uh part of the uh issue is that that humor is is really earned and that uh it's shared with people who would understand it it's not humor that would be meant to you know um, it's it's humor that's meant to bring people together. I want to I want to thank you for having me. We want to thank you for being with us. Yeah. And maybe then the last question. Yes. If there are no other questions uh, <clears throat> here, uh, we intermix kind of uh, you. Uh, human sciences uh, and human arts, uh, philosophy, poetry, music, etc. So art and, and science, uh, like under umbrella of being a prophet and seeking for truth or opening gate. Who, uh, which, uh, which would you prefer one in? in opening the gates. A science is color, like say the Litvaks uh, were more uh, were more relying upon teaching from God who was just working with texts and texts and texts with Talmudic texts and commentaries and so on and, and working out scientific uh, uh, right. yeah. yeah and then here is Bob Dylan singing yeah, I tend I tend to prefer uh, thinkers who have both a rational and irrational side, right? So I think that um, you know it's <clears throat> any mysticism is grounded in a healthy appreciation for the law, uh, observance of the law, or a rational side that is interested in the Wissenschaft, right? Of the uh, of the of the of the mystical or the irrational um the the there are certain teachers who become famous and important because they are just one or the other but my favorite are both okay yeah thank you Stephen, so much and we hope thank you yes we will, I, meet, uh, again. Uh, we will meet online and we will meet uh, i hope so here in our library. Thank you. Todaraba.